Um, cool. Hi. So my name is Brad Spaulding. I work at a company called Spreadfast based in Austin, Texas. And I am tonight going to talk about uh, React Router version 4 and deep linking with React Native. It's going to be kind of a split talk. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, what's new in version 4 and then how you would implement deep linking using React Router in a React Native application. So a couple of polling questions first. Um, how many people use React Router or have used React Router? Several hands, okay. Anyone never even heard of React Router? Have no idea what it does, tries to solve? Nobody, one person, okay. Okay, so uh, briefly, the idea is, uh, and we talked a little bit about, or Wade talked about, Doug talked a little bit about it. In his last talk, routing, you're mapping URLs to your components is functionally what's going on. Um, in the browser, there's uh, some history APIs to uh, respond to changes in the location locally on the client side and to update the browser location. And so React Router is sort of an interface to those APIs from your React application. But functionally, all we're doing is mapping URLs to components in your application. Um, so React Router version 4, what is new? We're going to kind of talk about four specific things. Um, First, there's multiple routers and packages now. Um, the route component is simplified dramatically. <laughs> and there's a new component called switch, which is notable. And then we'll also talk about native support before we go into talking about deep linking. So multiple routers. Can everybody read this? Is that big enough? OK, cool. So multiple routers and packages. Um, instead of just the React router package, you now have a React router DOM and React router native. Um, in the base package, there's static router and memory router. And um, so if you've used React Router before, you pulled in your router, and then you pass to it uh, some function you know, to create a history object to interact with the uh, API as a prop to your router. Instead of that, you now have different router implementations depending on what you want to be doing. So uh, if you wanted to just use a router, but you, you don't have access to the browser APIs because maybe you're not running in a browser, you'd use the memory router. If you want to use the new HTML5 APIs, you'd use the browser router. If you wanted to use the hash at the end of the URL and, and do it that way, you'd use the hash router. If you're, running, if you're doing server-side rendering and you know this route's never going to change, so don't waste time setting up event handlers and things like that, that's when you'd use static router. And then uh, there's a new package, React Router Native, which exports a native router. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later in the talk. So route is simplified. Uh, if you have used React Router before, the, if you've ever dove into the source code uh, of what route is and does, you'll notice it's not, it doesn't actually render anything. It's sort of just config, right? It looks like JSX. It's using JSX, but you're not really rendering anything in your component. That has changed now completely. Route, route is just a component, the component that renders something uh, or not. So uh, you pass a route a path, and you pass it a component. And there's, there's more to this API, but simply you pass it a path, you pass it a component. And if the current router's uh, path matches the one that you've passed in, it'll render your component. Otherwise, it won't. It's very simple. And what this means functionally is that Instead of having to have a big, sometimes complicated, sometimes hacky, uh, global routes definition and config for your entire application, you can put routes anywhere in your app. So in this example, imagine that we have a URL slash topics, and we render a topics list component and pretend that this is our topics list component. It's going to get a prop called match, which knows about what the current URL is. And you can generate links that are nested under that particular route, and you can also uh, render a route inside of that component. So we'll see what this does in a second. Um, if I, here's my basic example, and this is on the React Router website, the same exact example, I just stole it from them. Um, so this right here, this whole thing here is our topics list. But right here, we're rendering our route, and right now there's no route, so nothing's being rendered, we're just saying, please select a topic. But then if I click on a topic, now both routes are matching inside of our topics list component, so we're going to render that topic. Um, so this makes a use case like this, where you're nesting components all over the place, kind of a lot easier. Um, and keeping in mind that your, your component could be a redirect, right? So somewhere down further in your application, you might check some state and decide, we need to redirect back to authentication or somewhere, right? 
And you can just handle that with components, just like everything else. Uh, all right, so one consequence of this difference in the implementation of route is that routes are inclusive. If you just have a list of routes inside your component like this, um, and say you are trying to render the slash about URL, uh, both of these top routes will render, and your user component would get past you know, about as the user param, which is probably not what you wanted, right? Well, if you squint, uh, hard enough at the code on the right, it kind of looks like a switch statement, right? And so the first route here that will match will be rendered, and then switch will just bail out. And if you look at the source of this, it's really easy. Does this one match? If so, render it and bail. If not, keep going. Um, and so you'll notice the last one here is like a fall through for your 404 page or whatever that is. So that would get rendered if n nothing had matched uh, above it. So back to native support. Uh, two, two components I want to talk about in the React Router native package. Um, the first is native router. And really, it's just composing memory router and async storage. If you're familiar with React Native, there's a module that React Native exports called async storage, which is akin to local storage on the browser. And it's what it's doing for you is storing the current router state and the current history state inside of the local storage on the device, so that if you kill the app, you pop it back open, you render at the last known route location. Uh, so it's it's really simple. You could do it yourself, but this is doing it for you. Uh, the other module here that we're going to talk about is the deep linking module, and this is handling some integration with React Native's linking module, React Native, which we'll look at the linking module. That module exports some uh, events on URL changes. And then the implementation there is pretty simple. You listen to the event, you get a new URL, you push it onto your router, and then React Router will take care of re-rendering your application. And this does that for you. So if you have a, an application that you're rendering uh, with React Router, you can basically change your entry point to drop this deep, deep linking component in there, and the implementation on the JavaScript, script, JavaScript side is pretty much done. Uh, cool. So any questions about React Router, React Router v4, what's new? So far, no questions. Perfect. Yeah. No. Uh, any other questions? I don't wanna. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So the point the point I was trying to make here is that uh, if you had used for previous versions of React Router, you got this behavior without using the switch component. And so probably what you are going to want to do is simply add switch in to your route config. But the point, the, uh, and corollary to that is, if you think about just walking through your component tree and that route is going to render if it matches or not, these two components don't know anything about each other. It's the switch that's doing that part of the logic for you now. Does that make sense? Oh, sure, yeah. This is just a contrived example, yeah. Yeah, you would probably want to redesign, redesign your URLs, for sure. Uh, all right, any other questions? Before I move on to deep linking, we're going to move on. OK, um, so what is deep linking? If you have no idea what that means, basically, you have a website, you have a correla uh, correlating app. Uh, that could potentially handle some URLs that that website represents. Deep linking is the ability to do that. Um, and so implementing deep linking looks a little bit different depending on what platform you're trying to do it for. It's a little bit more difficult on iOS. On iOS, uh, your site needs to be on SSL. You just have to do that. That's probably the hardest part. <laughs> and then uh, you need this Apple App Site Association file that you'll host at the root. Um, and we'll look at that. You need to add an associated domain entitlement to your application. You'll need to update your app delegate and then listen to linking events. And we're going to walk through all those steps right now. Um, we're going to assume you know how to set up your server. Uh, adding this file, this file looks like this. Um, there's a lot 
of other features about the iOS platform that this file intersects with. Uh, but in terms of deep linking, we only really care about this details uh, array. It's an array of objects, and this app ID property uh, needs to correspond to the team ID and the bundle ID of the application that you want to handle URLs for that domain. And the paths property is an array of uh, globs. So you could say, OK, slash videos, slash whatever, my app can handle that. But slash support, that goes to our support site, and the native app doesn't handle that. Um, here, we're just. This is an out-of-the-box React Native application. We're saying all URLs can be handled by putting that asterisk in there. Um, one thing to note about this, it is a JSON file. Do not add .json to the file. Uh, just iOS will not, it, it won't work. <laughs> so I kicked myself for that one. Don't do it. Uh, I'm trying to save you time. So the next thing is adding the associated domain entitlement. This is pretty easy. Uh, you open up Xcode. You click on your target, you click on the capabilities tab, and then if you scroll down, you'll see this section. You can turn it on, and then you add some domains. And this will generate a bunch of stuff inside your Xcode project, like an entitlement file, and add some properties to your info plist. And you, that's it. You don't need to worry about that. One thing to note is that you do need to prefix your domain with this app links colon uh, scheme. All right. You also need to update your app delegate. Is anyone do mobile development, React Native development, or is this part just going completely over people's heads? No? OK, we've got some people, so that's good. Um, basically, on iOS, when someone clicks a link and that apps, Apple App Site Association file has been validated and your app looks good, the system will launch your application and call this delegate method. And fortunately for you, the React RCT linking manager module, which is part of React Native, ships with React Native, basically provides you an implementation of this method so that you can just forward that call on to React Native, and that's really all you have to do here. Um, this is a simple example. You should maybe be more complicated here and return false if you can't handle the URL and things like that. Um, now, that's all the native stuff. Uh, this linking. RCT linking manager module uh, exposes to the JavaScript side a module called linking. And basically, basically what it does is provides you this event bus for the URL event. And whenever a new URL, whenever that delegate method gets called, it'll pass that URL through as an event to your JavaScript. And then you can do whatever you need to do. So this is basically what the, that deep linking module that we saw before does is it's context aware. It knows about the router. and it listens to these URL changes and pushes the new URL onto the router. And then React Router takes care of the rest. Doesn't matter what environment it's in. So on the Android side, it's a bit easier. Um, you update your Android manifest, add some XML, and you're done. Uh, so assuming we just generated a React Native application, uh, we've got our main activity. You want to add a few things. You want to add this intent action view. You want to add. Uh, this category default and browsable. And then here's where you tell it, these are the, these are the URLs that I can uh, handle, that my ap application can handle. And it works a little bit differently on Android than on iOS. So hopefully, this is not going to be too choppy, and you can see what's going on here. On the far left, this is our React application running as a web application on the web, on an iOS device that does not have the app installed. In the middle, we're looking at an iOS device that does have the app installed. So you'll notice when it clicks the link, it's not opening it in Safari. It's actually opening the native app, but it's going to that URL. And then on the right-hand side uh, is an Android emulator with the same situation. And you'll notice that because that Android manifest is not secure at all, anyone could just say, yeah, I can handle URLs for apple.com. Uh, the system will prompt the user to say, Hey, can you? Wh what do you want to open this with? Do you want to open this URL with this application, or do you want to open it with uh, the browser? Are those demos clear enough? It seems really choppy on the screen, but okay. And this demo code is available next to the with the presentation slides. So if you want to take a look at it later on, you can. Um, so some resources: uh, the React Router docs. Um, uh, they're already updated for React Router 4, even though it's in a late beta. 
Um, so definitely go check that out. That basic example we looked at before is there. Um, the linking module in React Native, it's good to just take a scan through those, those docs. And there are links and notes in there for implementing the native side that, uh, in order to make that work. Uh, there's a WWDC talk called Seamless Linking in Your App, if you prefer visual learning. Um, and a corollary to that, uh, this support universal links is an Apple support doc that basically walks you through the same steps and describes it all in detail. Debugging universal links is an article that I found while trying to make that demo work, <laughs> and it's extremely helpful. One piece of information that is apparently out of date, though, they mentioned that it does not, you can't test it on the simulator uh, somewhere, at some point between when they wrote that and when I did this demo, uh, that is fixed. So you can test it on the simulator, which is nice. Uh, honorable mentions here at the bottom, stack routes and tab routes. This actually links to the React router source code. There's some experimental examples where um, they're just kind of implementing native looking transitions on top of what's already there. It's really simple. It's just kind of they hacked it together, but it's good reference. Go check that out. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention, I didn't cover the React router docs talk about animations and transitioning. And I think that's just for clarity. I decided to skip talking about that because the nice thing about the updates and that route is just a component is however you're doing animations now, just keep doing that. And you know, when a component gets rendered, your, your hooks to transition are my component got rendered or unrendered, right? So just do animations as you would normally do animations. Uh, a lot simpler. And then last thing I'll mention is just there's a project you might have heard of called React Navigation. It's in a very similar space. It's more mobile focused, although they do provide some routing implementations, um, and they do purport to be web and uh, native compatible. So yeah, that is it for me. Any questions on the deep linking stuff or on any, anything? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And it tries to do a little bit of fancy stuff, like if you slide on the cards on a tab view, it'll actually change tabs. And you know, on the card stack, if you slide back on the card, it'll slap back, back. yeah. That's not exported by the React router native module. It's, some, it's an example that they built on top of what's there. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you could easily, you know, use native router um, or memory router, and also use like card stack from Navigation Experimental. Exactly, just an example of that. Exactly. This is one implementation of that pattern. React Native provides you uh, some APIs to interact with their uh, JavaScript bridge APIs, because they manage creating the bridge and loading all your JavaScript and doing all that stuff. And so you have to go through their APIs to send events. And they have a few different versions of those APIs. There's event emitters. Um, and then you can actually just export methods and pass callbacks. Because you can pass functions across the boundary. Um, so you could actually, in JavaScript, pass a callback to a native module function, and then it would call back into your JavaScript code, which is kind of cool. Um, but events are the preferred way, I think, now. Um, so you would have a native module that registers itself as an event emitter and says, I accept these events, and then sends events. And then on the React Native, we'll take care of tying that together for you. So you would, like you saw on the linking slide, you would import your native module, and then add event listener to your module for whatever event name you declared. Does that make sense? Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, you, yes. So. Mm -hmm. uh, can you restate it for me so that I understand?
Gotcha. So the, the question is, if I restate it correctly, and correct me if I'm wrong, is uh, what is sort of the best practice way to call arbitrary JavaScript from the inside your React Native application from the native side in Java or Objective C? Is it okay? So the answer, arbitrary JavaScript. I mean, you can't. Everything is initialized by React Native, and your sort of React lifecycle started by React Native, and so. The ways that you can communicate across the bridge are somewhat limited. Like you, ha you have to with React Native, you have to actually register your class as this is a. I want to expose this as a native module, and then you can either send events in order to send events into the boundary, and you can do that whenever, right? Like when your class is created, you can fire off some background task watcher, and then when you get some data, you can fire an event across the boundary. And then if your JavaScript code registered an event handler, that would get run. Um, the other way that you can do this is um, your native modules can also, the, the methods that you expose can also return a promise, and React Native knows kind of how to deal with that. And so you can, because they try to enforce that all the communication is asynchronous. There's no synchronous communication across the boundary. So your choices are uh, events or promises, really, if you want to call back into your JavaScript code. I think, does that make sense? OK. Gotcha, yeah. I think I answered your question. Did I answer your question? OK. OK, cool. Yeah, if you check out the React Native documentation, there's uh, guides for iOS and Android for writing your own native modules and UI components, if you want to check that out. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. If you choose always, uh, it won't ask you again for that domain until you reset in that setting, um, yeah. So that's one way you could, I guess, get around that. But your users, the point is your users have to do it. The, the main, main huge difference is like your users have control over what applications can open URLs, and in this case, you as the developer have control. Um, if you're a user, maybe you're glad that you have control and maybe mad that, uh, the way iOS does it. If you're a developer, maybe you prefer having control. I don't know, trade off, right? Anything else? Yeah. As far as I can tell. So if you check out the documentation for route. Uh, there's a couple of different ways that you can uh, tell route what to render. One of them is just by passing in a component. Um, and so if, if you needed to pass new props, you could create a new component and you know do it indirectly that way. Um, the other way that you could do it is I believe there's a prop called render, which you can pass a function through. So if you had like something in your closure that you wanted to pass through, you could pass in a function to render instead of just a component and then Re, you know, return uh, your other component and apply that prop to it. it yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes. The Pac-Man. You could thank Spectacle JS for that, the formidable labs guys. Yeah. I had somebody tell me it was distracting one time, but I liked it too much. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? So I'll just say thanks. This is me on GitHub and Twitter. Um, the slides are here. I know that's super long. Uh, the code is there also for the demo if you wanted to run it. Uh, if you want that URL later, just come up to me and I'll send it to you. So that's it. Thanks.